we are very privileged that uh, we are having a public lecture um, and that too on a very, very relevant topic. And uh, I happen to be uh, sitting with my JNU colleague and uh, this is the first time we are sitting like that and perhaps since we are always meeting each other uh, on that account. And uh, my friend Nimi is an associate professor now at the Center for Policy Research. Nimi is interested in foreign policy, in particular India's border states, China's domestic politics, Indian and Chinese approaches to regionalism, and cross-border governance. Her recent work includes studies of the accountability debates. That's very interesting. In India and China, post Mao policy shifts in China's regional development, and Northeast India and its neighborhood. She has also produced a critical reading of the transborder sub-region and an agenda for India-China water dialogue. Mimi is part of the Asian Borderlands Research Initiative, a network of scholars interested in the reconfiguration of theoretical and methodological approaches to the study of borderlands. She is also part of the DCIM Forum a sub-regional track 2 initiative of research institutes from India, China, Bangladesh, and Myanmar to study processes of marginalization in the peripheries and suggest actionable and alternative imaginaries. She is a PhD in international relations from Jawaharlal Nehru University. So I would now request uh, Nimi Kurian uh, to speak on the periphery as hub, competing constructions of borders in India's active at, at these policy. Thank you, Vidhi. Uh, and uh, it's good to be back at the CRG again. And uh, thanks to Paula, I know she's not here, but uh, basically thanks to the CRG uh, for giving me another opportunity to come and listen in on some of these interesting debates as well as uh, to trade ideas, some of my formative thoughts on this issue. Uh, so basically what I'll try and do uh, in my presentation today is to look at three uh, themes or basically I've divided my presentation into three sections. First, I'll try and look at uh, what uh, are the some of the competing constructions in Delhi's um, at peace policy. Uh, so I use the two phrases very self-consciously that the periphery, uh, knowing it's a very problematic term, in, in no way do I mean that it is a periphery, it's not the self-image of the region, it is a Delhi-centric uh, uh, construction and it's a construction which is almost like an oxymoron because you are trying to project a periphery uh, as Delhi sees into a hub. So obviously it's going to be shot through with um, uh, a whole set of bunch of competing constructions. So that's my first uh, section. Um, I just before that, I was told by Paula and the others to speak about for uh, about 50 minutes uh, or an hour, which seems an overkill. So please do, if you think I should stop it at some point in half an hour or 40 minutes. Uh, I, I realize that public lectures don't have um, a Q and A format, but if you, if you, the chair decides. I mean, I, I'm. <laughs> So, okay, here we go, sorry. This is a, this is a first is the competing constructions essentially. Second is really to look at what are the reconstructions and what is the scope for reconstructions from the border regions and what is essentially is the scope for the border region to either subvert or facilitate the Act-East policy. And third is really to look at uh, to what extent is the border region at all a priority in a, in a, uh, in a policy that claims to protect it. So that, those essentially will be the broad uh, uh, three um, sections that I look at. So uh, first is then, um, I'd like to look at the, uh, when I see the Atlas policy, it is really, I think, a part of a whole set of sub-regional initiatives. Where, and it's a real al virtual alphabet uh, soup of acronyms, whether it's the BCIM, the BIMSTEC, the BBIM, or the, um, um, the Ganga Mekong, uh, the Ganga uh, uh, Mekong 
uh, cooperation GMC or whatever. Basically, it's so it's this entire alphabet, the alphabet soup of acronyms, all uh, projected at uh, exploring sub-regional, uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, integration. And together, I think that these um, represent what I would like to call as the sub-Indian IR sub-regional moment. And why do I say so? I say so because I think it's it represents Indian IR sub-regional moment because it represents a certain, um, it stands for a certain symbolic and discursive shift in Indian foreign policy and engagement towards the Asian neighborhood. Because what it does is to shine a very, a much needed light on the borderlands both as a missing level of uh, analysis as well as a missing level of governance and more importantly in, in increasing the, in the light of the discussions we have had as a foreign policy actor in its own right. So that essentially is how I would like to kind of frame it. And um, so um, <coughs> A little bit on sub-regionalism, we are all aware that while um, regional trading blocks and arrangements have always been a common phenomenon, the sub-regional uh, sub -regional cooperation represents really a novel extension of the larger area, uh, a larger idea in the sense that geographically proximate regions within two or more countries then become sites of transborder cooperation. And um, so, um, admittedly, when you look at the Actis policy, it is a feel-good um, uh, narrative. It, uh, it speaks a very comfortable cosmopolitan language. It speaks of projecting the borders as bridges. And so, uh, at its core is this liberal economic narrative of projecting the borders as bridges. But Behind the celebratory rhetoric really stands a very, um, you know, behind the celebratory uh, rhetoric is this, the Indian IR's uh, sub-regional moment, I argue, is a bittersweet moment. And I say that it is a bittersweet moment because it's really virtually caught in this, what I mentioned, uh, alluded to earlier, the co competing constructions between colliding narratives. So you have a... Um, um, uh, uh, even when you talk about Delhi, Delhi talks about borders as, as bridges, there is also, it is also curiously resistant to step, in, step away from the reductionist logic of borders as barriers. So, the, what this re really results then is a very confusing and a conflicted narrative and what, what Matt Spark uh, refers to as in another context as a the, the border region then gets suspended in a sort of double vision, you know. So it's like caught between geopolitical fears on the one side and geopolitical hope, uh, sorry, geoeconomic hopes on the other. So that's where I I feel this the the position of the northeast really or the or the border region is. Uh, you can situate it within this this sort of com, you know competing. Uh, and often conflicting and confusing narratives. So uh, that said, I'd like to take just look at this uh, from Delhi's political signaling. Three questions. So I mean, and that really resonate with much with a lot of what we have been discussing today, and I presume yesterday as well, about when we talk about the Actis policy. Who is the actor that we are talking about? Is it Delhi? Or is it the Northeast? And where exact? And secondly, when we talk about the Act East policy, where is exactly is the location of this action? Again, is it Delhi or is it the Northeast? And to what extent is the border region a priority or regional integration, which is supposed to be the driving, you know, in this feel-good narrative, the driving force at all a priority? When you look at the um, match the rhetoric with the reality. So when you look at these three three questions and then try and look at, examine uh, Delhi's political signaling, you can really get a sense of why I say it's a conflicted and confusing 
narrative and self-consciously so. It is, uh, it's, not, Delhi is not innocent. There is a definite politicality in the way it is uh, signaled. So the first thing is, you see uh, Prime Minister Modi's neighborhood first policy. It strikes the right note. He visits all the South Asian capitals. He calls or invites all the South Asian uh, no, staff leaders to his inaugural. So you have, you, it makes all, the, it sets the right tone, so to speak. But then, curiously, his chief economic advisor, the Government of India's chief economic advisor, Arvind Subramanian, actually is on record saying that integration within South Asia is not a priority for India. So how do you square two political, uh, you know, lead, I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, at the highest political level, these messages coming at the same time. And he meant, he said this not, mind you, at, in the wake of Indus or any such, or, or um, Uri, if this was said in 2015. So he's on record saying that. Then second um, is, when you look at um, um, the, the location, this is really the more, I would say, the disquieting or bizarre one. Like why are initiatives which claim to protect the, the border region never held in the border region? Or rather, why are initiatives like the BCIM, the BIMSTEC, uh, initi uh, initiatives again which claim to protect the border regions held anywhere other than except the border region? So you have the le recent example in Goa where the BIMSTEC uh, summit was held on the sidelines of the BRICS summit. And it was held in, in, where was it held? It was held in Goa. So, I mean, why on earth, and this is not a one-off. It's not experiency that makes it, um, makes Delhi locate these anywhere except the border region. So there is that, uh, there is that to kind of mull. Whereas neighboring China, despite the different political system, despite being labeled authoritarian and, and uh, um, uh, is able to uh, send a very powerful signal by by projecting its border province of Yunnan as as its um, um, as the as the member in, in as the constituent unit in any in all its subregional initiative to the extent that Yunnan is the Yunnan province is an international signatory of all subregional initiatives. Now that's something unthinkable for us that Assam government actually sits and like, signs an international agreement on behalf of all of India, which is what Yunnan has been doing for decades, ever since the uh, Western Development Strategy began. So, uh, I mean, that before we start labeling countries authoritarian and democratic, it actually this really messes up a lot of these labels. Second, uh, um, third is a quick example is, is regionalism, uh, is re integration of priority that I mentioned. A very quick illustrative example is this, the government of India has used to have till recently a scheme called the ASI. The acronym is immaterial because it's now defunct. But it is basically a central scheme to help promote uh, export infrastructure in, in uh, states. And the budget for this fell sharply from about 700 crores in just a matter of four years to 50 crores for all of India, Indian states. And so much so that I think last year the entire scheme was taken off as it was a it used to be a centrally sponsored scheme. Now it is off that list. So there again, you you wonder it's it sits. It resonates with what the chief economic advisor said, that regional integration is not a priority. Because when you look at the funds that are being released for facilitating extra export infrastructure, this is for stuff like things like you know building ports, warehouses, the real nuts and bolts of what would make a regional integration um, kick off. So, if, so my, my inference from all these little examples that I share with you is that if the AFT's policy is all about projecting the border region, we definitely are not doing a very good job at it. So, so 
Then it takes us to the next um, puzzle. So is Delhi essentially solving the wrong problem? So I think the problem is has a lot to do with what all of you have also referred to, is to the fact that Delhi tends to see the Northeast as a security periphery. And what it confuses to be a law and order problem is essentially a governance problem. But it tends to kind of um, uh, misinterpret this and that's where you get, you know, um, it's a, uh, these, uh, these conflicting, um, <coughs> these dichotomies at the borders that you see. So what is, the, what is the, when you look at the results of these dichotomies, is that the Acti's policy is a highly conflicted and a confusing narrative and, and a result of that we tend to miss a whole set of processes that I argue are actually working at, in, at informally at, at the borders and which offer the scope and potential for a bottom-up Acti's policy. And so there, there are, the policy itself is beginning to acknowledge or has the potential to acknowledge, I would rephrase, the, the, the rise of a set of actors with an interest in deepening sub-regional integration. So what exactly are these actors doing? I would say they are at, at the very least doing three things. They are engaging the Indian state. I mean, by Indian state, I mean shorthand the center. They are bypa occasionally bypassing the state, and they are there is a third potential of possibly socializing the state. I think one of the speakers mentioned in, uh, uh, mentioned the socialization process. I use it also in the context of um, of how it could possibly uh, you know create patterns of behavior uh, or alter Delhi's uh, perception at any rate of uh, of how it looks at the northeast. So, and engaging and very quick examples on the three of them engaging the state. You see um, uh, states in the northeast beginning to uh, lobby the center, uh, not just beginning, continuing to lobby the um, the, uh, the center uh, to, uh, for instance, reopen border hearts. So, in Meghalaya, you have Kalecha being reopened after 40 years, and so they are beginning to script these small success stories. And it requires, you know, institutional bargaining with the center requires tremendous amount of stamina and sustained stamina. So you, I argue that you're beginning to actually see a ragtag set of actors, not just state governments, but private sector, in, you know, civil society actors, whole set of actors who are interested in, in deepening cross-border um, integration processes. And the Acti's policy provides a sort of framework which could facilitate that. Um, and so that's engagement, engaging the state is that, that's one, the border hearts. The second is a quick example is uh, both um, uh, Tripura and Meghalaya have successfully lobbied the center to sell surplus power to, to Bangladesh. Uh, Tripura is, has finalized um, an agreement to sell 100 megawatts of power from the Palatana uh, power plant to Bangladesh. And this required, so what my argument here is that there are, uh, these are actors who have kind of, who have worked and lobbied with the center to create the, uh, you know, make the case for Modi to go across to Dhaka and sign the agreement. So it is not a Delhi-Dhaka agreement, but behind the scenes it's actors who, like these who have worked the system, who have interest in deepening these and see in this policy a space to kind of uh, further strengthen um, this. Uh, and these are, together I feel these are what I have called in my some of my writings as subterranean subregionalism. These are subterranean processes not yet acknowledged by uh, you know, largely um, neglected or ignored by mainstream research and policy, but these are subterranean processes that are beginning to have the effect of a whole set of stakeholders with a capacity to engage the Indian state to uh, to act as stakeholders in an act peace policy. Because no subregional blueprint can afford to can be a success without having robust subregional stakeholders. At, with, at, obviously, that is at the border region. 
So they, these are two exa quick examples of how the how the border states have um, engaged the state uh, the the center. They are they they have also occasionally, as I said, uh, bypassed um, the center and established direct uh, uh, links across the borders. And the, the same, the Palatana uh, power plant example is a quick, um, uh, you know, illustrative example of a success story, uh, where when the Palatana, it's a, a seven, 726 megawatt uh, power plant that when it was being constructed, Bangladesh allowed for the first time the use of its, ter its territory to be used to, to transport heavy equipment and um, um, turbines to Tripura and it's Bangladesh's um, support and prompt support that actually led to the successful completion of the project and today 100 megawatts from that project is being sold to um, uh, to Bangladesh and it's uh, it's interlocutors local actors like the like uh, it's the very good excellent relations between Manik Sarkar's government in Tripura and Sheikh Hasina's government, which actually allowed this to uh, this breakthrough to take place. And uh, earlier this year, I think in January, um, Tripura's power minister Manik Day went across and um, you know finalized the power tariff. Uh, so the per unit cost has been fixed at five fifty to be sold. So the long and short of it is that you also have this interesting example of when there is an institutional gridlock, the actually the the, the state level actors or the subnational actors actually also have an occasion creatively bypass the center and gone across and then brought the center on board. This is not to suggest that they are doing it over the heads of Delhi and Dhaka, but most fundamentally, the takeaway from me from this example is that Palatana is a success story scripted at the border region, and so that's that's um, why it's. I think it will be bookmarked in India's subregional diplomacy as perhaps the first example of subnational uh, problem solving. Uh, the socializing the state example that I mentioned that the longer term effect would be to socialize. Um, uh, the state, the Indian state, Delhi, into into choosing um, uh, uh, problem solving sub subnational or subregional problem solving options like, for instance, the Palatna. We don't have too many at the moment. There's not enough critical mass, but these are beginning to kind of, I would, I would um, argue, um, can create the scope. Um, and uh, but there's also you need to put in what is uh, for that socialization those socialization processes to actually uh, take effect you really need to put in a lot of institutional nuts and bolts which currently are missing so there's this huge very perceptible institutional deficit at the heart of the acties policy or delhi's engagement with its border region that needs to be addressed for instance where are the institutional Platforms for institutional conversations between the the between Delhi and the border region. The the existing institutions, for instance, less said the better. Inter Interstate Council formed um, after the Sakarya Commission's uh, uh, you know recommendations met in 2016 after a gap of 10 years. It is a forum where with where. Delhi gets to meet, sit at the table with all chief ministers, meets in 2016 um, after a gap of 10 years. That's one. There are 39 um, M M M MPs from from the northeast. Our, is that, that I would as I would presume is an easy catchment for you to kind of you know at, engage with and use. In, I mean, or. Uh, I mean that's a catchment to kind of who will be your chief actors to kind of implement the Actis policy. They and, and very often you notice uh, from uh, in papers or in reports about how these MPs themselves don't have access to the prime minister. How 
you know, so we have, we have read those, uh, you know, lack of contacts being a matter of um, discontent. The Northeast Council, again, less than the better, even after its um, mandate was uh, revised to be a regional plan planning body, it remains largely um, unfulfilled. So together, all in all, these three processes, very quickly, do they constitute um, uh, what I would call as as evidence of a um, bottom-up activist policy? Yes, they do. Uh, are they enough? No, they are not enough. But but at the end of the day, I would say that more than building, um, uh, you know, when we talk about logistics and infrastructure, at the end of the day, these are questions this is really related to the larger question about how India really sees its role in the region, how what sort of a leader it would like to be, whether it would like to be, as, as a scholar mentioned in the context of Brazil and polls just as well for India, whether it would like to be seen as a quote-unquote leader of the last resort, disinterested in, in, in investing in regional public goods, or would it be so these are not these are not going to be matters of choice. These are going to present very tricky normative choices for India uh, going forward. Very quick example: they would can can India afford to, for instance, allow a discrepancy between domestic norms and norms that it will it will adhere to in the region? A very quick example is the very controversial. Um, a coal-fired power plant that India is developing in um, in co uh, uh, cooperation with Bangladesh, which is at the heart of the Sundar. So this is um, uh, uh, this has led to huge uh, public protest within within Bangladesh, where and the reason I say that this represents a normative dilemma for India is because the same. Um, power plant, same sort of parameters um, was uh, the, so in the NHPC is to, is NTPC is developing this the National Thermal Power Co Cooperation was denied permission in Madhya Pradesh to build a similar coal fired power plant on environmental because it simply did not pass the environmental um, uh, clearance but the same uh, on the same set of parameters India is going ahead is and by in building one in uh, in in a, on a 50 50 cooperation basis with with Bangladesh. So the discrepancy I argue between its domestic the adherence to its domestic norms and and the kind of norms it will it will uh, choose to uh, ad ad adhere to or 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 uh, disregard is going to actually create put India's credibility on the line. And so, these are at the end of the day not a questions of choice so much as a responsibility of how much to what extent its uh, its power will be uh, seen as um, as acceptable and credible. I think I'll stop with that. <laughs> I think we saw a very, very wide canvas, uh, um, and uh, it was so wonderful to hear uh, from the experiences of the BCIM and uh, you know this whole perspective of you know I, I uh, what I felt from your paper was that as if Northeast is a blank state, blank, and <laughs> Indian government has to bring policies and make hearts as if the hearts never existed, as if the trade never existed between uh, you know the two countries, as if. So, you know, and uh, and also it seems that it is almost like an unwilling partner to the BCIM or to the any any trade relations with the Southeast Asia. So if that kind of attitude remains, uh, the NEC and all, they will remain the white tigers, you know, they, they are just feeding them and they are not giving us any, any output from there. So anyway, but then uh, we have such great people uh, like you and all in, 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 in policy making initiatives and hope something will come out and it was a very very comprehensive and I must say very uh, timely and also very comp uh, you know concise uh, paper uh, which could really expand into very wide canvas and uh, I think it has really brought 
a lot of thinking in everybody's mind um, and we, are, we will go back with that mind. Thank you very much, Nehmi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Purin. That was uh, really thought-provoking, and I'm sure we'll come up with many other questions.